The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. All right, let's not get too crazy in here. Um, welcome to the Stoa, everyone. Uh, Peter Lindbergh, the steward of the Stoa, a place where we cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the nice edge of this very moment. Last session with Daniel Schmachtenberger, sense maker in residence for October Digital Porch. Uh, we all sit on uh, the digital colonnade and the porch and just chat uh, and have a conversation with Daniel. Um, so far, it's been uh, kind of like anything goes, but we're kind of refining the frame each time. Uh, so how today is going to work, uh, throw your questions in the chats in a moment. Uh, I'll tell you when, and then I'll call on you, you me yourself, ask your question, Daniel. Um, if you don't want to be on YouTube, because this will be on YouTube, uh, let me know that, and I will read on your behalf. So Daniel's going to um, set the frame uh, for today. Um, he mentioned it last time, but we're just going to repeat it again, and then uh, start throwing your questions in the chat, and we'll go from there. So Daniel, I'll take you in, my friend. I think you can unmute yourself now. Let's see. You look like you're in like a mastermind boardroom okay. and you just like kind of like erased all your, your uh, formulas for, yeah, there you go. <laughs> all right. Good to see everybody. And uh, I've enjoyed the three conversations we've had so far. And this is the uh, last one of the series. And yeah, I, the, you know, original inquiry was, could we, uh, address questions. And so I was happy to do questions of any type. And it's just in clarifying that a bit, it seems like the main interesting intersection of questions that happens to be possible here in novel is not just asking about how do we solve world problems or just asking how do we develop ourselves for personal developmental reasons, but at the intersection of the development of ourselves in relationship to and service of what's going on in the world and what the world needs. So, you know, there's one that just asks the world question is like, well, how do we solve multipolar traps? Let's take a specific example. What would a good economic solution be? But people have asked questions in here more like, how do I learn more about the kinds of game theoretic considerations to navigate multipolar traps without being corrupted by it internally? It's like a development in the presence of world dynamics. So I think the, I think the intersection of those questions is really fascinating. I like I care about both of those spaces independently, but particularly the intersection of them. And it seems like the stoa is uniquely well suited for that. So just clarifying questions about and personal development means the development of the person, not just what seems like psychological well being, but cognitive development, skill development, network development, whatever. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm interested in people's questions and inquiries in that space in particular. Right. So, boom, uh, start throwing your questions in the chat right now. Um, you know, take a breather, maybe settle in, uh, and then people are just bombarding questions already uh, and just kind of feel into it. Uh, and I'll, I'll take someone in a moment. Let's see if I can start off with a question um, related to the STOA and personal development and my personal development regarding that. Um, I'm finding all the challenges coming up here is really serving as like a force forcing function to practice my stoicism and becoming more virtuous, um, which is quite cool. I didn't really expect that. Um, and one challenge or theme that has come up and I feel like it's going to come up more. And we, we talked about it before on WhatsApp is kind of the unhealthy parasocial relationships and how people can start uh, getting fixated on you um, because you're in broadcast mode and whatnot. And I, I wrote this entry on kind of cult to culture and that kind of hit, I put like some people secretly want a cult um, and they want to project things on you. Uh, and I wonder how you deal with that. Cause yeah, I'll just say this, um, this session in particular, these series has the most people reaching out to me uh, requesting things uh, like, Oh, you should do this. You should do this. You should do this because um you know, you, you are pretty popular and then your YouTube videos, at least on the Stoa, have more than most people. Um, and so I wonder how you, you deal with it personally and if you have any advice uh, for me or other people at the Stoa who are increasingly becoming a more public figure and want to do good in the world at the same time. Yeah. 
this might not be obvious to everyone since I've done quite a lot of um, speaking publicly on podcasts and various things, but uh, I've never liked public speaking. Um, I actually particularly don't like attention on me as a person. And so I just avoided it for a very long time and tried to uh, work through channels of influence that were less public. And I was particularly bothered by when people would focus on me, like even this question, uh, as opposed to focusing on the topics that I was interested in. And there's actually a certain point at which I just had to accept that that's going to happen to a certain degree and not be too bothered by it um, if sharing publicly is useful. And, you know, both work to encourage people to focus on the topics rather than personas, but also not let the aversion to that get in the way of sharing things that can be useful. Um, I think if someone is coming from the other place of having kind of desire for it more than aversion, there's slightly different things to uh, work with. I will say if there's anyone who is kind of excited to uh, share things and be well known for them, it's just less fun than you might think it is to have lots of people uh, in a position to either have hope attached to you that you have no ability to really do anything about and then other people be able to straw man you that you can't address all of those things like is yeah I, 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 I wouldn't say that's a particularly fun thing um and the other thing I'd say is the the degree to which somebody actually cares about anything right they have some basis of values and um integrity the more incongruency is painful and so then also the more reflective they are and notice the incongruency the more kind of intolerable it becomes so peter when you were saying as you're here sharing these things you actually feel kind of a impulse to practice and embody the things that you believe more because you're holding the space for other people to do it uh I think that's actually one of the cool opportunities. I, you know, there's this perspective that says heal or heal thyself, like get your own shit straight before helping anyone else. And there's truth to that. But there's also truth to in the process of helping other people. Uh, there's a kind of learning that happens in sharing and facilitating and teaching that is different than the learning that happens just on the other side of it. Pedagogically, the whole uh, learn, do, teach model uh, as part of learning is, is very interesting. I've noticed a lot of people who became therapists actually became therapists because at least in part, as they were helping other people develop psychologically, they were gaining continuous like instantiated nuanced insights about the nature of the psychology and other people. And it really helped them in their own reflection and growth. So that's interesting. How do you uh, relate with impression management and um, like doing good in the world um, in a broadcast medium uh, where you're sort of like, there's an avatar of you gets created in the spectacle. Um, how do you relate to that avatar? Because uh, I know I know you seem very um, careful about what you say and you want to know your audience in case any kind of information hazard kind of gets unleashed or something like that. Um, so I'm curious how you relate to your own impression in the, in the spectacle. In, in a way, obviously, that kind of informs uh, me and other people who are putting themselves out there. Yeah, I mean, if you have a clear sense of why you're sharing something publicly, you have a sense of what the positive opportunity associated that you care about is. Um, you know, there's kind of a SWAT. There's a there. There's some threat or liability associated with the opportunity, and you just think through that. And so, for instance, talking about catastrophic risks, because you mentioned information hazard. If people don't understand the reality of catastrophic risk, then there aren't enough people who care to work on hopefully solving it. So there's benefit to try to help more people understand how uh, eminent catastrophic risk possibilities are. 
And yet, if you get so detailed that you start saying, okay, let me give you examples of very specific types of terrorist attacks that are possible and specific fragilities in supply chains, you're actually helping a lot of people who don't understand how to cause problems, understand how to cause problems more with that research. So there's a direct info hazard. So it would have the benefit of motivating some people. It would also have a risk associated. So there's definitely responsibility in um, considering those things. And typically, like there are some people whose work is as a public intellectual where their public sharing is the main method of contribution. But I think more often what's effective is that people have projects that they're working on to try to benefit things and the public sharing is, a, is adjacent or you know facilitating something associated with that. I don't think, I would think doing this is very useful by itself, like it's not, Hopefully, it's not totally useless, but um, there's a lot of people who I work with right now in projects who I found through these mediums, right? There was putting some information out, and it served as a kind of bat signal or a tractor dynamic. They're very useful to projects that have theory of change that I really believe in. And then to the degree we want to actually launch projects that need some public traction, having groups of people that are in similar conversations that weren't happening, that get to be a, a place to advance certain kinds of cultural projects and movements is useful. So have to think about the public sharing as part of usually more integrated strategies. Great, thank you. Um... So I'll, I'll start searching for some uh, questions that are at that intersection, but uh, Benita Roy privately messaged me a question. That's her secret technique to get me to choose her. Um, Benita, uh, I, I really like your question. If you can unmute yourself and ask it to Daniel. Daniel, oh, let me get this. Hi, Daniel. Um, yeah, so, you know, I wanna know like, like who are your mentors? That's kind of like, elders from you to elders but also like who are the young people that you think are emerging like you know like like they're not there yet so you're not gonna maybe uh advocate for their whole uh their whole view but like where where do you see something emerging that seems um like something possible that hasn't been possible before, like like in what fields or what individuals, and and again, like these are half-born thoughts, right? If you're looking at young people or these areas, and then you just I'm gonna throw this on this because you said you're looking at people who have interesting theories of change, and I was just wondering who the, who, who they were. Thank hey. you. Yeah. Um... Mentors, I, f I feel like I've always been fortunate to find and be able to interact with really good mentors. And there's so many topics that I know are really consequential that I'm interested in that I don't have really deep expertise in. And one of my fastest ways to try to get enough of a sense that I can navigate it, hopefully, uh, competently is to find experts in the space that I think are earnest and really care and particularly find multiple of them that disagree on critical things. And so then I'll reach out to them and really try to understand, uh, have them guide me through the basic understanding of the topic and what they think are the foundational truths, how they're forecasting it, uh, those types of things. And then also, and why the field is consequential, what they think is important that everybody's getting wrong, you know, those types of things. And then where people that I think are earnest and smart, good thinkers who've spent 10, 20, 30, 40 years working on a topic, and I'm just not going to be able to catch up with that, where they disagree. And is it because they're looking at different data, because they're coming in with different epistemologies, because they're weighting the data differently, um, using different models. And if, if I can understand where they agree, what is seen as common knowledge, where they disagree and why, then I start to feel like I'm getting some sense of how to navigate it. Then I wanna see what would it take to bring about agreement, right? Bring about consilience. Um, 
So I have, like, I actively seek out people who I think have good expertise in areas of history and various sciences, social sciences, whatever, and have been fortunate to have a lot of them willing to spend a good bit of time, like, educating me. I just got off the phone with someone that everybody here probably knows, Jim Rutt, uh, and he is, um, you know, providing ongoing advice from a kind of CEO coaching point of view to what we're doing with Consilience Project. Um, and we have a we have a bunch of really great advisors that are providing advice and everything from technical to communications to brand strategy to the experience of what makes a good online forum in terms of the digital architectures and moderation and things like that. Um, I was just on a great call yesterday with a guy named Gilbert Morris, who should come on here at some point, who I think has one of the more novel and really nuanced perspectives on the history of uh, race and slavery and the situation in the US and kind of a third pole that is neither the pro or anti-critical race theory that, that I think could actually further. And so I've been, um, you know, kind of diving deep with a bunch of people, uh, he's one of them, to understand those issues more from really different perspectives, perspectives of people who grew up in Africa, who grew up in the Caribbean, who grew up in, you know, US and Europe and studied it from different perspectives. So mentors, uh, a lot. And I don't require that I agree with everything to take someone as a mentor. And I also don't require that I agree that I would take them as a mentor in all spaces to take them as a mentor in a space. Um, I think when we're young, being able to get holistic mentors that are more like parents is easier. Um, as we go on, you know, being able to find someone that you can really take their expertise in a domain and not reject it because you really disagree with them in some other space is important. In terms of uh, what seems promising in terms of younger people, It's interesting to watch uh, like the way the rationalist community started to have very, very informed, high quality conversations where the people were, were actually quite well self-educated and were thinking about epistemology and formal logic and good faith dialogue. And then where they actually started to get to the limits of pure rationality and starting to think about symbol grounding issues. So then they started like circling and getting into different aspects of um, other intelligences. I, I think that's kind of interesting. Um, and I think there are some people who like, we focus on the downside of being a digital native and growing up in a digital environment where you get false intuition. You don't get an intuition that is kind of conditioned on physics, but on somebody's manufactured physics. And that's true. And that's the more widespread thing. But there's some subset of digital natives that got kind of very epistemically oriented who are just fucking amazing at online research, and specifically the open source intelligence field. Um, they're really exceptional at being able to do uh, scrubbing of large amounts of data and image recognition and things like that. And that starts to offer some way to counter the asymmetric info warfares that are out there. So I find that very interesting. Seeing things like what Aubrey Tang and friends in Taiwan are doing with digital democracy and how to kind of counteract uh, misinformation and do better sense making participatory governance. I think that's quite interesting. Um, so I think there's a number of emerging spaces that that I appreciate. Um, and some of them are very different. If you take kind of the, the uh, you know, OSINT space, and then you take the like permaculture intersects with psychedelic space, um, there's some intersection, those are quite different, but there's that, and, and there's some really kind of significant omissions or flaws in each of them and some gifts. The fact that some of those spaces start having an intersection is actually promising to me. And that's the kind of meta tribe thing that's being explored here, which I really like. It's why things like the intersection of thinking about macro systemic issues and, and how we personally and as a group relate to those is something that I am hopeful for. 
And then the last question you ask was theories of change. Um, yeah, that's that's like a big thing I'm working on. And, and you happen to say that you were looking at some people who had interesting theories of change or something new on the horizon. It's, that's, I think it's a that's a big deal for me anyways. Yeah, I mean, this this would easily take several sessions to try to say, when we think of a theory of change being good, does it mean that we've mapped the problem space well enough that we can define a theory of change that is both necessary and sufficient and be able to do some proof of sufficiency? Is that what we mean by interesting theory of change? That's a very high bar. And, or does it mean that there's something that from a forward engineering, that's kind of from a reverse engineering point of view, or from a forward engineering point of view, a theory of change acts on a certain level of sense-making and agency in a way that both increases sense-making and agency. So even though it's not clear that it converges towards sufficiency, it's increasing its capacity in a direction that could converge. And then maybe there's a theory of change that by itself is not anywhere close to sufficient, but it's really meaningful and in connection with a number of other things could start to map towards sufficient, something working on governance, something working on market, something working on culture, you know, et cetera. Um, so for, I'll give you just a random smattering of theories of change that I think are at least well-informed that friends of mine in adjacent spaces are working on that are not like commonly talked about. So <clears throat> if you look at the way that the economy has shifted recently to have more winner take all orientation than it previously had. And small businesses closed during COVID, lots of unemployment happens, but the value of Amazon and Tesla and kind of top stock companies double and um, those types of things. And then you look at the fact that, you know, something like 2000 to 5000 families own most of the world's wealth. And even though they don't necessarily own all the wealth when you factor just people owning their houses times how many people there are in land, those people don't control the financial industry um, or the, the underlying um, you know, financial markets. So disproportionately to just ownership of capital is the ownership of the change in underlying market dynamics. So when you look at that and you look at the winner takes all type dynamics that continue that wealth concentration. And then you combine that with high speed algorithmic trading that can make very fast money on money returns. You combine that with the fact that the militaries of nation states can't, the really top end capabilities they have are weapons of mass destruction that nobody wants to use. So if you take those away, private militias are basically as big as nation state militaries, and those are available to the top families. Uh, so basically nation state level military capacity is accessible for hire. And then you take that they don't have people that they have to have elect them in again, and they don't, and yet they can affect campaigns and elections across countries. They don't have land they have to protect, but they can influence uh, land deals. There are a lot of people that think of this as the new emerging feudalism, the 21st century kind of feudalism where um, families start becoming more dominant actors than nation states. Um, and so the theory of change being how to maximally meet the needs of those families in a way that also influences them that what would cause major catastrophic risk is actually decrease in security for them. Uh, like that's, that is a totally valid and interesting assessment and theory of change. And it couldn't be more different than something like Bjorkman's, um, Bildung kind of model that is much more decentralized, bottom up, cultural, um, trying to decrease that wealth concentration. So there's like one side says the wealth concentration is, it's pretty inexorable. So really try to influence the top of the power law distribution. The other side says, can we do a rolling debt jubilee or something to change that wealth concentration, reboot a new financial system? Those are both interesting. And then the question is like, do you run a portfolio of those strategies? Is there a way that those can have synergies with each other? And then when you start to look at strategies that emphasize something like market versus military versus culture versus state and legislation, are there synergies between those? Because nobody can do all that work. So they end up emphasizing a particular subset of actuators 
and yet multiple actuators, if they were in the right synergy, become more powerful. Um, so I'm interested in a network of solutions that maps to sufficient, not a solution that maps to sufficient. And so I'm interested in people that can have really good faith interactions with each other to increase the coordination across different earnest theory of changes. You're good, B. Any follow Thank up? you. Thanks okay. so much. Um, all right. So next up, we'll do Ryan. You have something about design principles. So if you can unmute yourself. Oop, how do I start video? There it is. <laughs> hey, Daniel. Thanks. This has been really fun. Um, so I had a couple of questions. Feel free to answer one, none, or any of them. Um, and they kind of piggyback off of what we were just talking about, about good faith. Um, so I'll just read them out. What are the design principles that you have found most useful when engaging in collective problem solving? Are there criteria that you rely upon to promote or create a pro-social environment within which a group of problem solvers are more likely to encounter meaningfully useful discussion, questions, potential solutions, and generate working models? Have you found that there is a, quote, Dunbar's number of sorts for agents involved in collective design? And lastly, how do you think about leveraging embodiment techniques or ritual to invoke such a container? Thanks so much. Yeah, this great question. Uh, and if I don't address all the parts of it, come back to them because they're all good. So when you talk about design principles, there's kind of the object side, which is what are the design considerations for understanding the problem space and a good solution? And then there's the more kind of interpersonal side of how do you get people to coordinate well to engage in collective uh, problem solving and design. And I heard you more asking the second one, um, but probably both. So I'll see if I can address them both a bit. If, if you haven't had it yet, um, having Forrest on, probably Forrest and Zach together to discuss EGP and AGP, which is something that Forrest spent the last few years working on as a design methodology for doing um, complex uh, problem assessment and design criteria to do this thing he calls transcendental design. Basically, how do you do design in the complex rather than the complicated domain in a way that maximally anticipates and internalizes externalities and also has the right design iteration process to be able to internalize externalities and additional considerations that weren't forecasted. So it's both an upfront and an iterative process. And uh, I would say it is the best process that I'm aware of for how to understand the problem well enough that you get the design constraints to think through a solution. Um, and that's the EGP part of it, the ephemeral group process. Um, and I'll, I'll just briefly say, and I'm not going to address it at all, it starts with purely questions. Um, and this is actually a really valuable insight and just for everyone to kind of factor in your own design thinking. So we're before saying, okay, we're building a bridge here. Now we're going to do a design shop on how to build a bridge. The bridge is trying to solve a problem. But the bridge might also cause some other problems, which is why if we have a proposition to make the bridge or not make the bridge, you're going to have half a people on either side, right? Very rarely do we have a proposition in, in a kind of government situation that 90% of people are on one side of, which means that most any proposition that goes through, about half of the people really think it's a dreadful idea. And so that process itself can't not polarize a population. And there was, I don't remember who it was, but there was some founding father that made a statement around uh, voting as the death of democracy. And most of us think about voting as democracy. And it's like, no, 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 the town hall where you talk is democracy. Democracy, the democratizing the process of input into figuring something out is what democracy means. Voting is what you do to sublimate warfare when you can't figure it out. Um, but the goal in a town hall is can we all share our problem assessments, the things that we value, the criteria enough 
and then be able to dialogue about this solution and not just yes, no on that solution, but that solution is pretty good for these things, but it causes a problem here. What if we do this, right? And so you come up with something where everyone's like, going ahead with that is better than the other options, right? And even if I have some compromise, the compromise is better than the warfare associated with the non-compromise. But if we can't get that and we're like, no, fuck it, just no on that. Way. And so we go to a vote rather than bullets, then the population will start to polarize along those voting lines, increasingly so. And then you start getting a situation where whatever somebody does, then in the next term, the other people are trying to undo. And most of the energy goes into internal friction. And you just can't do shit when all the energy goes into internal friction, right? And this is why the combination of a, a binary two-party system or a yes-no on a proposition system where half of the people will dislike anything combined with a mostly voting and no, no real town hall type engagement combined with term limits makes long-term planning almost perfectly impossible. Um, because whatever you're going to implement, if it doesn't create its returns within the four years, you're not even going to try. And you know whatever you do will be undone after those four years. And you know, so um, so that's obviously not functional. And then and in the business sector, it's often an even tighter. It's a quarterly time scale, um, depending upon the nature of the business and if it's private or public. Um, so Obviously, before we have a proposition that we vote on, we should have some process to say, what would a good proposition be? Did we even have a process to figure out what is everything that people care about, why some people are saying no to this proposition, other people saying yes, so that we can even do a design process to come up with a good proposition. The fact that we go straight to voting on propositions that somebody makes up with very partial insights and usually vested interest, usually special interest. And we don't even have a formalized process for the proposition development. Like that's so obviously inadequate. Um, and so maybe the bridge that we're gonna vote yes or no on, the bridge proposal, it's like, well, why does anybody wanna make a bridge? And it might just be a construction company wants to make one because they're gonna get the contract and it's purely vested interest that just sucks for everybody. Well, that's kind of worth knowing, right? But if there's a real reason that these two areas are separated enough that it takes two hours for people to commute where it could take 15 minutes and there's an economic situation where it really makes a difference. And so then you say, okay, the underlying need has to do with a particular set of economic needs that are associated with transportation. It might be that a bridge is the way to go. It might be that because of the negative environmental or aesthetic or whatever effects that that bridge would have, that a ferry is a way to go. It might be a bridge somewhere else is. It might also be that developing the local economies on each side where the people don't have to commute is a way to go. There's a lot of other options. Once you start to understand what are we trying to benefit and then what are the adjacent associated things that could be harmed by a particular solution? What is, this, what is the space of things that we care about? So you have to do some deeper kind of questioning before you move to proposal process. And, uh, so one of the things that EGP does is get people to really generate the map of relevant things that become the basis for design constraints. So then you can do a design by constraint kind of methodology and say, what is the best synergistic satisfier we can find? And then you have an iterative process on that. One of the other things that happens though, as far as social cohesion is people don't polarize on other people's questions in the same way they polarize on other people's statements and propositions. And so if I make a statement that says we should do this, someone can instantly have a negative reaction. But if someone says, you know, I question what some of the negative environmental impacts of a bridge might be, everyone can be like, that's a fair question. You know, I'm a fisherman. I like to fish. I don't want it to fuck that up too bad or whatever it is. Right. Um, and so one of the interesting things is that the question asking process inherently can allow dialogue with less intrinsic polarization and people don't have ego identified with their questions as much as they have ego identified with their solutions. And um, so it also leads to a binding of a group in a different way and not the cleaving energy for the group. There's a bunch of other things that are involved in this that are really interesting. It also makes everyone a better sense maker because if you ask questions and then 
the question you ask, you have an initial question that a group of people are going to be exploring. The first question you ask is what additional questions would have to be addressed to really be able to answer this one well? And then what assumptions are built into this question and what is fundamentally valuable related to this question that we're trying to understand? You get people to actually become better sense makers for their day-to-day -day life ongoingly. Plus they get to see other people asking good questions they didn't ask that actually positively gets them to want to perspective seek. So there's a lot of badass design built into that design process. So that's a few things there. Now I'll answer more on the, in a small group of people that I'm hoping to have be deeper or longer term collaborators, less of a society-wide solution. What, what have I found helpful to get people to collaborate well? If there's anything I wish I had better answers to, it's this. Uh, I can't say that I have had success here anywhere near as well as I wish. I can tell you some things that don't work. I can tell you a lot of things that don't work. Um, I can tell you some things that seem like they have worked to some degree. Um, and then some things I'm hopeful about. The more you try to have people who say are not engaging because they're being paid and there isn't a command and control hierarchy and they're just authentically coming together to, to work together, the more you really try to accomplish tangible shit that way, the more you start appreciating command and control hierarchy with people that are paid and the ability to replace them with other people that will do a thing because it just is so much fucking easier. And, um, and it's, it's important to actually come to understand why the thing that has been selected for has been selected for to not just have naive ideas about the other things. Um, so it's good trying to implement some of the naive ideas and really try to be accountable for the output and watch them fail to then come to understand. Um, specifically, one of the things I found so interesting is one of the things that really messes up deep collaboration, good faith collaboration is optionality. Um, if I've got some poor people who all can't afford to buy their own house, and they're all really struggling, and they decide to build an intentional community together where the way they do a land co-op actually allows them to someday own something and gives them more like foundational Maslow's hierarchy security, those people will put up with a decent bit of difficulty from each other and in working with each other to make the thing work because they have a real need that needs met that creates binding energy that overcomes the cleaving energy. I'm trying to do something with people that have already been somewhat successful in the world, who have the ability to do something at larger scale, all of whom don't need the thing to work because they got enough money they can just go somewhere else if it's difficult. The privilege and optionality that that creates makes one willing to put up with less difficulty um, most of the time. So then you have to say, okay, well, how do I bind myself to... So um, if I got a bunch of people who've all been CEOs or could be CEOs and they can basically be mostly in control of shit and they're used to being effective at being in control of shit they, and they can recognize that there's an upper bound to what they can do on their own, but it's a pretty good upper bound. And if they come into relationship with each other, they won't have the same control of shit and they optimize to be good at that for a reason, right? They psychologically were oriented to be good at that and like that. And now they're going to have other people that have a very deep say in how the things happen. And, um, and they're just as invested, but without as much of a sense of full agency. And like, that's, that's difficult. So I have found people trying to do intentional communities or collaboratives or whatever. Um, the people that have what seem like higher level capacities to affect change in the world because of what they've already done are some of the people that have the hardest time actually making meaningful sacrifices because they don't feel like they have to. Um, so then someone has to have something that motivates them more than the seeming comfort of their own life. And that's a nice idea and it's also hard. Um, this is, yeah, I know you guys had Pat Ryan on before. He probably talked about um, 
blackmail as a currency of coordination. Uh, there's always this question when you're trying to coordinate where you're going to share some knowledge with the people you're going to coordinate with, where if that knowledge was widely shared, you would lose some of the ability to do the thing because you're going to corner a market opportunity. You're going to release some patent. You're going to you know, do a military attack, whatever it is, where you actually need some element of being able to control the information. But you're like, the, the challenge is, if I want to implement something at some scale, I have to share some information with some people because I can't do the whole thing myself. But if I share information with them that, and they defect and share that information with the public, the police, the competitor, the whoever it is, that totally fucks up what I'm doing somewhere between I get put on a bayonet or in jail or just become a pariah um, or lose the market opportunity. How do I share the information to allow the coordination and protect against defection? And in a government setting, it's, you know, you take an oath, you have a commander, you violate the um, confidentiality or the classification, and you get thrown in prison, right? You, you, there's a military prison, all that type of thing. In rule of law, generally in contract law, you sign a contract, you can get taken to the court, the court will enforce it. If we're in a gang, and this is the mob, and you snitch on somebody, you're just going to wind up floating in a river, right? But if we're talking about inter-elite coordination, where you can't have the people just wind up in a river and you also can't use rule of law because there is no rule of law for the thing that is happening, how do you prevent defection? And so the idea that having some kind of mutually assured destruction on each other in, the, in a space that has power, which would be the public sphere, which you know would be something like blackmail, uh, that 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 can facilitate coordination. It's not facilitating trust, right? It's not facilitating coherence. It's facilitating anti-decoherence, right? Or anti-defection. But that fundamentally means that it is like the culture is intrinsically fucked, right? The culture of the thing is not a trust-based, but a maximally guard against non-trust-based situation. So then you have this question to say, if we don't have a place where rule of law is the thing that we get to use, and we want to create real trust that binds people to, to each other and to a mission where they don't defect under duress, where that would be consequential. And we don't want to do it through some form of punishment. Well, what do you do it? What creates the binding energy that prevents defection under duress? And you know, knighthoods had a model for this. And of course, they sometimes would kill someone for defecting. So it wasn't without the stick side. But the sacred oath, where someone actually had a sense of what they were willing to give their life for, and that they were actually willing to give their life, that there was a transcendental meaningfulness bigger than their life. And then they could see that these other people authentically took the same oath. And so that there was something that they, they couldn't defect on each other without defecting on what matters more to them than their own life. Um, and so they have a binding with each other that is actually mediated through whatever the transcendental values are. I have some experience of that working and I hope to have more experience of that working uh, as time goes on. Um, no, I don't think it's just enough for everybody to do uh, ayahuasca together and have some like nice experience that, that feels very deep because the question is how does it hold later under duress? Um, but you know, when you study the Masons and you study the Templar and you study those types of traditions, you're actually studying a set of social technologies that was developed very much to do that thing. And I would say, most of the people that are working on how to benefit the world right now are not studying those technologies and what the modern applications would be as much as is useful. And I would say, do think about how people's optionality affects it. That's an important thing. Um, there's a lot of things I can say. Having a culture inside of a group of collaboration where everyone takes more of the responsibility for the problems on themselves and gives more of the credit to each other helps a lot. Like if that's a cultural value that everyone does. So rather than have the status competition of you're, you're like, hey, you copied my thing or whatever it is, 
I want to actually, whenever I'm talking and I'm saying something, I learn from you, if I can credit you and I can help, I can help whatever your motivators are, where you actually experience the things you're motivated by working better, working with me than not. Um, but where that is symmetric, right? Symmetrically, that's held as a value and maybe even a vow. Uh, I find those things are quite helpful. I also find not setting them up as vows up front and just seeing what do people naturally come in with? What is the disposition that they hold? Because if they don't already have that disposition, they might not even be able to or want to be bound to it by some agreement. So to some degree, simply observing where people are coming from first and not moving too fast is helpful. We could, we could talk a long time on this one. Ryan, did you have a follow-up? I don't want to take any more of your time. That was just really, <laughs> really fun. Yeah, that was, that was great. Uh, maybe if you could just talk to embodiment principles or techniques, uh, not ayahuasca ceremonies that maybe uh, help with group coherence. I'll share something uh, that Forrest could expand on again. Um, I don't know if people here have, how many have basic familiarity with some of the concepts in the eminent metaphysics, the domain of the eminent, the omniscient and the transcendent. Uh, I won't belabor this long because I don't have the time to explain it, but if you do have the familiarity, there are types of bonding and coherence in each of those domains. And one of the things I would say is that it requires bonding in each of the domains. So when you say embodiment, you're probably mostly talking about coherence in the eminent domain. And this is, this is everything from um, a tribal practice of dancing together uh, in a drum circle around the fire before making, before tribal council and making a decision there's something very profound that happens in that kind of ritual because in the drummers are both doing their own thing and being in sync with each other, right? They're all kind of following a bass rhythm, but they're also doing their own thing. So there's a balance of agency and communion. If they start doing their own thing that is out of beat, it'll sound really shitty and everyone will be like, what are you doing? But for them to kind of improv, so there's a, how do you find individuality in a way that also has harmony? And the dancers similarly are all doing their own thing, but to a similar beat, right? So there is a, but maybe some are on the half step and some are on the double step and the, so there is a way that there is harmony between everyone with, with individual expression. And that that can create an embodied experience of like, oh, we, we have some deeper than semantic level of connectedness and familiarity with each other. Then we go into the tribal council, where we're gonna talk through something and we're bringing in a sense of, positive bonding with each other plus coherence with each other, right? Coherence in the eminent. Whereas coherence in the omniscient, in the cognitive would be like logical congruence. Are we factoring the same data? Do we have the same weighting algorithms on it? Are we using the same propositional logic? Um, but eminent coherence can also be doing a barn raising together, which also means build a burning man camp together, right? The barn raising or the burning man camp is we're experiencing actually working together and you get experience like who doesn't actually really fucking work um, and who claims a lot of work and didn't who really does. How does that kind of fix itself where there is a sense of like, oh, we're all in this together working supporting each other making the thing happen a real thing happened. And there's a experience of a certain kind of coherence that happens from building some real shit together that you don't get from any level of in psycho emotional bonding group therapy or cognitive work right it's the, the eminent domain it's a different thing um, <clears throat> so i would say looking at some kind of uh can we actually work together can we find coherence and work together and can we sync together in some kind of fundamental and embodied ways then can we find logical congruence? Are we running similar axioms and epistemics? And in a transcendental way, are we oriented to similar values? Do we have a similar kind of set of transcendental values that we're oriented towards? That there need to be some practices in all three of those areas 
for it to really be effective. All right, beautiful. Um, and we actually do have fours coming in tomorrow. Um, maybe I'll just plug that right now while it's alive at um, 3 p.m. Eastern time. Margaret and myself are going to have a discussion with him on the ephemeral group process. So that's pretty cool. And also that blackmail guy, Pat Ryan, uh, he's going to be in um, this Friday for another session of the Dark Stoa. So check that out. Um, a question uh, from Carrie above on the ethics of a vegan diet. Uh, if you can unmute yourself and ask your question, I copied and pasted right here in the chats. Hey, Danielle. Thank you. Um, so I heard you speak uh, in an interview, I think it was about six years ago, on the ethics of a vegan diet. Um, I'm a nutritionist, and so I've thought about food quite extensively for 20 years or so. Um, so it's interesting to me because diet seems to be at the intersection of personal choice and personal impact and community, global and civilizational impact. Uh, with 2.6 million years of human species eating meat, it seems like we carry a biological imperative to eat some amount of animal for our best health. Um, and I heard you speak something about like thinking about it really carefully and educating oneself on how to eat a vegan diet well and algaes and different things. But I see accessing these things as somewhat challenging, not practical for everyone, potentially even privileged. Um, so how can we move out of the nightmare of the commodification of animals, but still meet our omnivorous needs? Uh, this this is one of the trickier topics. Um, I kind of wish that you didn't bring it up because it's very hard to feel like we can do any justice to it in a short amount of time because the science itself is actually very complex in the formal sense of the word complex, meaning what metrics do I pick to measure health and which of those are differentially benefited more by different diets and did I control properly? Did I control for other environmental factors and concomitant factors and genetics? And, and so you'll have a China study and then you'll have a refute the China study and then you'll have an Atkin study and then you'll have a, and um, while I have seen some comparative nutritionists try to look across those data sets and compare them well, I have not seen epistemics that I consider adequate to the problem space yet. Um, so when we're talking about ethics, obviously there's gonna be a what is actually possible and what is actually true objectively that is gonna be a part of that. If, if people really can be fully healthy without eating animal products or they can't be, the ethics of it is totally different, right? And then you have things like short-term versus long-term and how long did the study run for and does it you know change over time and and different genetic backgrounds and microbiomes and whatever and so i think the complexity of the science is is trickier than almost anyone i've ever talked to acknowledges because like people coming to the issue of race they come from either that they've been absorbed in critical race theory and the associated histories or the almost opposite kind of the social science. And so the preponderance of what they've been exposed to makes them feel more certain. And the view that they've had of the other side is usually their side debunking the other side. And so to the degree that a topic is polarized is the degree to which even if people are familiar with both sides, it's through bias that they don't recognize. That's really tricky. And I think the way we feed ourselves is so primal, right? Like one, two, three, five times a day, I'm going to be doing this thing. So somebody telling me how I should or shouldn't feed myself. And it goes against my culture, my early childhood, my sense of sovereignty, my, like, it's such a big thing. And, and on the same time, the, it's kind of the thermodynamic basis of our impact on the planet, right? As a species is that thing. And there's so many of us that the, that the net collective consequence of it is so important to consider where you can't take a purely individualistic approach without Kant's categorical imperative, does this work for everybody? And um, so I think it's just an authentically tricky topic. 
So I will share a, a couple high level considerations. So I became a vegetarian when I was a kid, when I was nine. Um, saw a factory farming truck. It was a kind of horrific scene. Red Diet for a New America, got into PETA and animal activism and like that. And then when I was a teenager, became vegan. I just hadn't studied the dairy part yet. And I, I have been up until now. I'm 40. And I am... You know, my blood labs look good. I lift weights. Uh, you know, I, I am in good health. My energy is good. So uh, that works for me. And I have tested at different times to see, am I missing something where I don't have a good reference? So let me take a, you know, some small amount for a period of time, uh, eggs or whatever it is that would be the test of the nutrient I might be missing and see, do I notice a real subjective difference. I'm going to have a very hard time noticing an objective difference, especially when the blood labs are already in a good range. And I personally have not noticed a difference. And I have noticed many people who have. And I've known a number of people who have tried to do uh, vegan diets and were much healthier for some period of time, oftentimes because it was the first diet that they did really thoughtfully. So it meant that they just cut out a bunch of refined food and grains and whatever. I find that actually most any diet works for somebody at first, if it is basically a movement from something like shitty unconscious standard American diet, that if it's in the direction of cleaner, more whole foods, more organic, whether the macros are mostly fats, mostly protein, or mostly carbs, they're going to do better than they did on the like sugar and hydrogenated fat diet. Um, and usually any of them that they go to, they'll have some more consideration of calories and micronutrients and some basic things like that. I find that there's a lot of diets that people do well on for a short period and then badly on, like too long on keto or too long on Adkins or for some people too long on vegan, or for most people too long on fruititarian, where the imbalance in macros and the associated imbalance in micronutrients that go with it end up becoming not good long-term fits. I think realizing that most people in our evolutionary environment didn't have access to the same type of food all year round before agriculture makes it pretty clear that dietary flexibility is the thing that was our primary evolutionary environment. So we would have had some times where there was more animal products, less animal product, different kinds of uh, vegetation, but never like as much salary as we want all year round or as much, you know, like that just, that's a, that's a weird thing. And so I think that creates metabolic inflexibility, microbiomic inflexibility, things like that. I think as far as the ethics goes, I don't think that anyone puts forward a reasonable case for why factory farms are a good idea or an ethically reasonable idea, ethically, environmentally, health-wise, or any other wise. I think it's one of the like obvious great blights on the world. And one of the things that I'm, I get sad about, so I have friends that are vegan for ethical reasons, and I have friends that are hunters for ethical reasons, both of whom I respect, because they're, if they're in a real earnest inquiry around what is true, what is effective, how does their choice, how would it portend for 8 billion people doing that if they're really in it, I don't think that anyone can claim the basis of authority to say you have to come to this conclusion or you're a bad person. Uh, so I mostly care about the depth of earnestness with, it, with which one is inquiring and practicing. But sometimes I will see people go from, say, a vegetarian conversation to a, a conversation where it ethically makes sense to eat animal products for them because they think that we can't get heme iron or B12 or evolutionary environment of omnivore or whatever it is. They have some argument like that that would justify going in bow hunting or something. But because of that, they just slide to animals are in rather than out and they'll eat McDonald's. And... I think that is super sloppy ethically, right? So how much meat does somebody need to eat if they feel that they need to eat some and how was it sourced? 
is really important, not just a binary, it's all in or it's all out, right? I think if someone has endeavored to apply a vegan diet well, and they have tried to study the nutrition of it, and they don't feel that they can be as healthy, then there's a very straightforward ethical conversation around it's not causing unnecessary suffering to kill some other life because they are in some ongoing degree of suffering by not doing it. So now we're weighing sufferings and now we're in an, in a authentically difficult trolley problem, right? But we're in a real ethical problem as opposed to just a black and white, it was unnecessary suffering for no good reason. Um, of course, there are heaps of questions under this around, but how do we know what the subjective experience or consciousness of an animal is compared to a plant? And uh, I address some of those in that dialogue that you saw and that takes a little while. Um, and I, I wouldn't consider the same type of proto qualia for a blade of wheatgrass as I would for a redwood tree. Like I, I think those types of categories are also nonsense. Um, or obviously for a clam as for a chimpanzee um, in the domain of animal. Um, when we think about When we think about the fundamental principles of ethics, one of the, uh, this again, a lot of things for us did a very good job formalizing the ethics of continuity and the ethics of symmetry is a really nice formal art way of framing up ethics writ large. Ethics of symmetry is one of the main ways we think about ethics, which is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Or um, Rawls's original position right? You design a society, but you don't know which of the roles you're going to be put into and design a society in a way where you'd be okay being put into any of the roles. And make sure that if you design a deal with somebody that you'd be willing to take any side of the deal. Um, pie slice theorem. I can slice the pie, but you get a pick. Or you can slice it and I pick, but I don't get a slice and pick. So these are ethics of symmetry. Would I trade places? Do I actually feel that the thing I'm dealing is fair, not in a bullshit sense, but in the embodied sense, I trade places. So if we extend that to animals as sentient creatures and say, would I trade places here? If people aren't asking that question, I don't think they have contemplated the ethics yet. And, and asking the way we design a system for say a species, right? Cows or chickens in relationship to humans from Rawls's point of view, would I be willing to be put into the cow place there or in the human place and say like, that's actually a reasonable position or did I design something where there are positions I totally wouldn't wanna be put into? It's some form of, um, you know what we would consider abject slavery or something like that. Uh, so I think thinking through that is important and so the hunters that I respect have a complex relationship with killing every time. Like they have some basis by which they feel like that is actually, you know, there's too many deer in the area because we've killed the apex predators in the area. They're actually helping to balance the environment, getting that there as opposed to factory farm meat is better, even as opposed to agriculture that's coming through conventional agriculture producing wheat that is, you know, destroyed whole forest lands, that that feels like the right thing to do. But it also doesn't feel like nothing to them to kill the animal, knowing that what that animal's experiencing is a real experience and what the other animals that were part of that herd or whatever are experiencing watching it. And even more so if I raised it my whole life, right? And then the thing shifts. So I think someone's relationship with it should be complex, right? Like, I think if it's really simple, it's because someone has actually stopped wrestling with the wholeness of it. And if you look at most of the kind of tribal cultures, they had a very strong no waste orientation, right? They didn't take more than they needed. And so in a situation where it's like, we're talking about health, but then most people are obese on the thing. Mm, no, that's fucked up, right? Um, does it make sense to take it from much worse sources and more than is needed in a way that's actually harming me, not helping me? No, that's ethically fucked up. Right? I don't hold that everyone sh necessarily can or should be vegan. 
I hold that some people can. I, I don't hold that no, no one can. From experience of a lot of long-term people that are quite healthy. Um, I hold that everyone can be much more responsible with their choices. And, you know, like, also, I, I try very, very hard not to buy plant products that come from conventional sources that had damaging effects on the environment in the nature of how the conventional agriculture works. So it's not, that's another binary that people do of like, meats in so i'll take the factory farm stuff or i don't do meat so whatever plants i do are fine no, no like the 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 glyphosate wheat that is fucking up the environment or whatever is actually really bad um and kills lots of animals and the nature of how those threshers work and the you know field mice and snakes and birds and pollinators and whatever um i think it's hard for us when we're dealing with very large supply chains that we're emotionally disconnected from whereas if I was growing all of my own food, picking, picking a carrot just doesn't feel the same as slitting a goat's throat. They don't feel like the same kind of experience. And there's, a, there's something that goes with being connected to that whole thing. And honestly, picking a carrot or wild harvesting a berry doesn't feel the same as clear cutting an area of forest to create row agriculture does, right? And so to try to take these very large scaled things that are invisible to us, like go to the factory farm, go to the co conventional farm, go to where clear cutting is happening, go to the landfill and really get in touch with what your life is producing and then say, fuck, how do I actually take better responsibility for this? Now, one can go excessive here and try to have not causing harm be the whole thing they focus on. Their life will just get smaller and smaller because they actually realize, if I drive on the road, I'm causing harm. An electric car versus a gas car, my bike, the rubber, where'd it come from? The, and so that can just shrink you into, there is no way to have your hands totally clean in a world that is built on institutional violence, right? Like it is institutional structural violence. So there's a certain place where I am complicit by being in it, that's a kind of ethical humility that has to happen. But then to also say, I'm gonna minimize those harms while also maximizing my capacity to change it. And if I'll never fly on a plane because of the climate change, but that also means I can't go possibly influence the thing at the, the UN or wherever it is that I got invited to do, then I might be causing less harm in the moment, but decreasing my capacity for a larger offset. But then again, that doesn't just mean, well, I don't think about plane flights at all, and I will do infinite amounts of them because it got put into the binary category called plane flights are cool. So I, how to really take responsibility for the things that I'm affecting, but I can't tell I'm affecting. Right, I can't tell because they're out of my senses. That's the deeper consideration I would offer. Any follow-up question, Carrie? No, that was uh, really excellent. Thank you. I live at a, a regenerative agriculture eco village and am sitting with potentially uh, exploring this complex relationship and killing a chicken. And so that really was wonderful, thank you. All right. Um... I'll say one more thing about that. When I was a kid, I uh, really just loved animals and took in all the sick and injured animals I could find and our house became kind of like a animal rehab place for some time. And that also meant that there were animals that weren't gonna get better, that were really suffering, that we had to kill, put out of ongoing unnecessary suffering. So starting somewhat young, I learned how to mercifully kill something uh, that I was dedicated to trying to save, right? And that I cared about. And that's a very interesting process, right? Vets obviously have to go through that. And typically one desensitizes when they do too much of it. Because uh, like think about someone who became a vet because they love animals. And now they're in a situation where they're just euthanizing beautiful dogs all day long because people are fucks and breed dogs and they shouldn't. Um, like, how do you not shut down? And so I had a process that every time I killed an animal, I, I was completely tuned in with it, right? I was feeling it, I was loving it, I was wishing that I had been able to help it more. And I cried every time, right? But I also wouldn't not do it. 
because it needed done. So like you have to both have the courage and the sensitivity bound. And if you go on either side where you don't have the courage or the sensitivity, you kind of fall off the razor's edge there. So when you have that experience with the chicken and the community does, that they really just feel and hold the whole thing. Thank you. Yeah. All right, uh, we have 15 minutes left. So um, we'll sneak in this question from Evan and then we'll close up. Uh, Evan, uh, I pasted your question below. If you can unmute yourself and ask it to Daniel. Yeah, thank you. So um, I think a lot of people on the STOA might be in a similar spot to me here. And so I'm gonna ask this question kind of generally. Um, so a lot of us want to spend more of our time and energy helping to actualize the sort of non-rivalrous systems and dynamics of the future that you talk about, and um, but are also in a situation where we will be literally homeless if we don't keep our day jobs within a month or two. Um, and these day jobs require us to spend our time in a game A or rivalrous kind of context. And um, so I, I would just love to hear your take on how one can actually make moves in one's life to um, to move into a way of making one's way in the world for oneself and one's family, making a living in the world um, without being so deeply attached and dependent on these sort of um, you know rivalrous game, a corporate dynamics that that most of us have to spend you know eight hours a day doing. Yeah, I get it. The best answer I have isn't awesome. Um, so things that I did, one was for most of my life, I kept my overhead extremely low. And so I did life design that made it to where I wasn't on the hamster wheel of, you know, make a little bit more and then want to spend that little bit more on all the things that society makes it very easy to want to spend it on that then binds me to that thing because I it was very clear that I was trying to liberate my time. And then I saw it, what are the ways that I can make more dollars per hour doing things that I believe are good, even if they're not the very best things because I'm not trying to get my sense of how I'm, my theory of change in the world is going to ever give me dollars. Maybe it will, but I, I'm not connected to that. I'm not going to do something high dollar per hour that I think is really bad. Um, so when I was doing construction as a kid going through college, I remember seeing that uh, the electricians made more than people framing and I was framing. So I taught myself electrical work and then started doing that. Right? Like I just kept seeing how do I increase the dollars per hour to not increase the total dollars, but to decrease the hours while keeping the dollar needs more fixed. And, you know, then I was doing counseling work with people. And then I learned that doing executive coaching was basically counseling that charged more. And then I learned that strategic business consulting for businesses made more than the executive coaching thing did. And it was like, what skills would I need to develop to actually be able to help here that are also teaching me something interesting and valuable? And then how do I progressively keep the hours lower where the rest of my hours get to keep growing and know that it won't happen that instantly. Like the development of right profession is a you know, it's a developmental process years. Uh, and if someone, now I mostly never had a job like a W-2 type thing. I mostly took contractor type positions where I could control the dynamics of my hours and charge and like that better. Not, not everyone is oriented to do that as well. If you're in an eight hour position, uh, and you don't know how to make more dollars per hour in some obvious way. And obviously taking the time to explore how to do that is time outside of those eight hours that you're not trying to figure out anti-rivalrous stuff with. Um, a few things I would say. The people who were under feudalism for most of the history of the world could never ask this question. Like they didn't have eight hours and then some free time and some access to knowledge and development uh, or even the freedom that if they economically freed themselves that they weren't forced into some position. Like it is 
even to be in what seems like economic servitude here, have no money and savings and be, you know, a month away from homeless, but to not be working 12 or 14 hours obligately a day um, is actually a, a situation that allows us an upward vector that most people never had. And most people in the world still don't have. Now to say, but fuck, I'm tired at the end of eight hours and, you know, I, I want, I like, I need to chill or rest or do something else. That's real. And the depth to which we care about it can motivate finding more energy. Um, now, one of the tricky things is like, what resource do you focus on first to be able to leverage other resources? Do I just really double down and focus on money making so I can buy free time and fun projects? Or am I going to really try to focus on my health so I have more energy so I can work 15 hours a day? And so I've got a solid seven outside of the eight that I work, but I'm going to put some energy into health to have like the physical vitality to do that. Am I going to try to double down on my learning straight towards, you know, game B type things? I've never found a good answer of like the order of operations is really figure out discipline first and then figure out money. I found that it's like, you level them all up one notch and you kind of take a moment, you level them all up one notch and then you level them all up one notch again. And, um, and it's very easy to focus on how we wish it was that it isn't in a way that is disempowering that just makes us feel kind of shitty, but to focus on, I just don't find that a useful focus to focus on that we actually have some developmental opportunity and development happening. And then just keep saying, how do I double down on that? is the most useful focus. And then I would say, <clears throat> like, to the degree you're in those eight hours a day, can you experiment with game B type things? Can you even learn more about game A by bringing, like, not just being there kind of disengaged, but saying, fuck, I'm going to move up through the ranks here and learn how business really works. I'm going to learn more about middleman and I'm going to learn those things to just bring more like care and engagement to your learning and development, I think, can happen most anywhere. When you realize everything's interconnected, then you realize that any domain of learning can be laterally applied to almost everything else. Um, yeah, those are a few thoughts. So quick follow up, if I may. Um, so I, I like what you had to say. Um, I spent most of my 20s uh, learning and being only occasionally employed in a more contractor type basis like you described. Now I'm employed in a, well, currently in an engineering type role, and I'm starting to feel a pull to not do that. And I remember you said in one of these earlier STOA sessions that most people should probably have a job rather than work for themselves. So I'm wondering specifically focusing on like, how does one decide, um, or what is your advice for someone who is in the process of deciding whether or not to continue with a pretty good job for a pretty good company that's making the world at least marginally better versus to strike out on one's own and accept the much greater levels of uncertainty, precarity, and risk in the service of trying to actualize something that you feel that you've discovered in your heart and want to share? I won't answer this the same for everybody because I think a I think a lot of people kind of mostly just want to live a good life and they would like to leave the world somewhat better than they found it, but they're not hugely aspirational or ambitious about that. And that's okay. I think that has always and will maybe always be the case that that's where most people are. And so have a job that is doing something somewhat good and also allows some free time and some development is probably great. If you are possessed by a need to solve problems that you can't not solve, then it's a different answer. In which case I would say, I would take a job if and only if there was really strong developmental opportunity in it but not just to maintain myself in my life, but if I had the opportunity to either learn a shit ton, you're an engineer and you get to work with some of the best engineers in the world and your software skills get to become epic, which can really help future shit. In which case, when I'm there, I wouldn't stay eight hours. I'd stay 12 hours picking those guys' brain, doing additional shit and trying to learn everything I could, right? I would actually take the developmental opportunity. Or you have the ability to 
not just perfect your craft, but adjacent areas. You can move up in management and other things and learn how businesses work so that you might be able to either launch something or understand the intrinsic problems associated with them, or you can grow your network there a lot. <clears throat> if there's very real return on your time in a developmental way, then um, even if the project itself's output is not all of what you care about, but it's increasing your capacity to do the things you care about in the future, good. Um, if it's not, I personally would rather get a van, be homeless, decrease my costs, figure out how to do a little bit of gig consulting and find something better and get off the hamster wheel. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, we're going to land here. Daniel, any closing thoughts, um, like anything that came alive from this session or the series as a whole? I really liked all these questions. Uh, some of the questions, like I said, I wish we didn't ask the diet one because I, because I wish we had, I don't know, 10 hours to start to address it. Um, but it's actually one of the most important questions and base of like, how do we take care of ourselves as a human and what's the impact of that? And how do we think through that? Um, and how do we come up with our own ethics that we care about so much we're willing to modify our own life without trying to force that on everyone else? And how do we feel okay not forcing it on everyone else if we're so sure it's right, we're willing to sacrifice for it? That's a microcosm of how to deal with Israel-Palestine and Shiite Shuni and every other major clusterfuck like that in the world. So um, yeah, and the question of like, how do I take care of my financial needs in the world while wanting to contribute to something else? Like these are all, I think every one of these are questions that all of us have to wrestle with. And how do we live in this world while trying to move it towards a better world? And so I'm hoping that the questions that other people asked, other people found interesting and meaningful. Um, I would love to hear if people, you know, want to write feedback afterwards of what was, uh, what was both good in this process for you and what could have made it better um, format wise or anything else, because uh, yeah, I, I don't get to talk with people about these types of things very often. I enjoyed this and would be quite happy to do more of it in a better, you know, in an even better setting if such a thing became clear. Uh, so feel free to put um, in the chats what you got from it and maybe Daniel can check it out. Um, and I'm inspired to, because we're going to launch a, a metagame mastermind here at the Stowe again, and we're going to have crews where we help each other out, kind of source the collective intelligence to answer these questions. Um, uh, so we don't want to just rely on the guests coming in to, to uh, drop their knowledge. But uh, very grateful for you, my friend, for coming and sharing your knowledge and wisdoms with us. I uh, would love to have you back. You may or may not be uh, uh, coming in a couple of weeks. We won't say anything about that. But um, thank you so much for coming to the Stoa. Likewise. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Going to plug uh, some events. Uh, we got a fun one this Wednesday. Uh, the problem with the sense making scene, imagining beyond the uh, echo chamber. Uh, this is with uh, Ellie Hain and Tarn uh, Rogers John. So these are two insiders of the sense maker scene and they're going to critique it. So that should be quite fun. Um, and I got exciting, something exciting to announce. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, boom. It is maybe not the end of the world election party, November 3rd, 24 hour event. Uh, we got Wim Hof, Stoic Breath Trainer. We got election meditation, collective presencing, shame breakthrough boot camp, uh, Socratic speed dating, existential dance party, rap on battle, and many more jazzy titles for you to enjoy. Uh, that's gonna be posted tonight uh, on the Stoa website. Uh, let me stop here. Uh, I will drop those links. Um, and there's gonna be a 24 hour Zoom or Discord channel too that we can all chat on uh, to process the craziness. Um, so I'm going to take in uh, before we go on a bio break, we're, we're going to have a wrap on battles now. Um, so some of you might be here for it, but if not, I'll take in uh, Tyson and Tyson, if you can give it a quick plug before we go on a break.
Sure. Thank you. Yes. Rap on Battles is a space for us to practice freestyle rap and spoken word, all right, as a way of engaging in a collective inquiry and practicing dialectic and ultimately building communitas. And it is open to all participants and spectators, even if you don't rap or have never rapped before, or that's a little intimidating, you are welcome to come and play in this space. And I look forward to seeing you here in a few minutes. Beautiful. All right, so uh, thank you again, Daniel, everyone, for coming to the STOA. Uh, we'll go on a uh, play some music. If you want to leave right now, you can. If you want to hang out uh, to check out Rap on Battles, uh, feel free to do that. But uh, we will take a turn off the recording now. <laughs>